We're just going to jump into growing in grace as we already are. Growing in grace because you can't grow what you don't got. Amen? And just having those opportunities, those moments just to say, okay, Holy Spirit, where do you want to take us? You'll be amazed where you go. Amen? And so, Jesus, we do want to just say thank you today for your grace. God, I thank you for the grace that we've known and the grace we've walked in up until now. But, Lord, I ask for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to enlighten the eyes of our understanding today to all that grace is in the life of the believer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Isn't Jesus amazing? He really is. He's incredible. He's better than you thought. And you've already thought he was incredible, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Amen? In Ephesians chapter 2, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. Ephesians 2, verse 4. It says, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1, 3 says that every spiritual blessing has been given to us where? In heavenly places. And see, when we were dead in our trespasses, when we had nothing to offer him but all of us, grace went to work in you and me. Aren't you thankful for grace? And the great thing about grace is grace never quits working. Amen? So not only are we seated in a heavenly place in Christ Jesus, but in the, age, in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And the word for kind, see, kind and nice are very different. Love is kind, but love is not nice. The word nice actually means to be agreeable to the plan of man. Kind is to come into alignment with God's plan for your life. Nice is that you just allow everyone else's flow to determine your direction, right? In fact, the word nice actually comes from a French word meaning stupid. All of a sudden, all of a sudden next time you're not going to be like, oh, that's nice. No, that's kind. When you actually look at the word kind in the Greek about love being kind and love being patient, the word kind means to actually to, to set an order furniture so as to receive a guest, it's a lot different than nice. And so here we see that grace is expressed in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And so grace doesn't leave you the same. Grace goes to work and begins to start moving things around in you so that he can begin to move through you. Grace brings things into order in our life and our priorities and the discerning of our season and the honor of God in us and the honor of God around us and the thanksgiving we have for what grace has delivered us from. Verse eight, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. And see, grace is the gift of God to us but what we do with that grace becomes a gift that we get to give back to God for his glory and give away to humanity for their good. Gift is given, grace is given to us, but what we do with it becomes the, the gift that we get to return to him. You see, it's grace, living by grace that allows us to hear on that last day, well done, good and faithful, hallelujah. Hallelujah. For by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. How many of you are thankful for the gift of God? Yeah. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. In other words, nothing you can do can earn grace. It is a gift. It is a gift. But it is a gift to not be taken for granted. And Hebrews 10, 29, actually the writer of Hebrews talks about the spirit of grace. He says, of, of how much worse punishment do you suppose uh, will he be worthy who has trampled the son of God underfoot, counted the blood of covenant, which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. And so grace can be taken for granted. And the way that grace is taken for granted is when we refuse to do what grace has called us to, 
or we give ourselves a pass on something that is clearly communicated in a scripture that we're to walk in. Have you ever said or heard someone say, well, you know, I, you know, I, I know I should be doing that, but there's grace. What they're looking for is mercy, but the problem is, is mercy is for your past. It's not for a present mistake. Mercy doesn't, so when we, when we say, you know, I know that I'm supposed to do this, but God knows my heart and there's grace. Grace is not the excuse to do less or to be less. It is the divine enablement of God to become the more of God that we are called to be. And the same way that every one of us want more of God, we wanna experience more of God in our life. We wanna walk in the more of God, not just for us, but for others, because the more of God has touched us and we wanna see that more of God touch others. Again, he is not the God of just enough. He is El Shaddai, the God of more than enough. And grace will always, biblical grace will always bring you in to more, amen? He goes on in Ephesians chapter two, Say, saying that it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship. In other words, we are, we are the hands, we are the feet, we are the vessels of honor that God has fashioned. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So we're not saved by good works, but once we're saved, we're called to walk in good works. Our righteousness is not connected to the work that we do, but his righteousness is revealed through the life that we live. Jesus actually said this in Matthew 5. He said, you are a city set on a hill. You're a light that cannot be hidden. You're, you're salt and you're light. And he said that when you walk in the good works, Matthew 5, 14, the good works your father has prepared for you, men everywhere will begin to praise God. And so part of what God is wanting to do in our nation and the nations of the earth is dependent on us living our life uh, as the light of the world and, a, and salt to a city, walking in the good works God has prepared because it's the goodness of God to us and the goodness of God through us that causes men to repent. Amen? You see, God could act independent of us, but he has chosen not to. He has chosen to reveal himself through a body, which we are all members of. Isn't that incredible? It is such a privilege to be members of the body of Christ, to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. And when we don't value that place that we've been given, that's when we insult the spirit of grace, but we don't have to insult it another day. We carry with honor in our heart what God has called us to and thanksgiving for what he has brought us out from. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. David said it like this, all of my days are what? Written in your books. And what grace does is it turns the page that you no longer live from a past chapter but you live from a present revelation and a future hope. Jesus came not only to save us from our sins, but also that we would have and enjoy life in abundance. Say abundance. abundance. And Mike, I think it's squealing back on me a little bit. Maybe just take a little hair off, hallelujah. Abundance. Abundance is part of God's plan for you, but it's not just to make you have more stuff. It's so that you can be more freely receiving of what God has given and more freely giving of what you've got. Amen? Because abundance is not just to you, it is through you. That word abundance in the Amplified means uh, to the full till it overflows. The overflowing life of Jesus. And see, there are measures of grace just like there's measures of faith. In Romans chapter 12 and verse three, we say, Paul, Paul's writing to the church in Rome and he says, listen, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought for everyone has been given what? A measure of faith. And some people have been taught that, that everybody gets the same measure, but that's not even what that passage is about because that passage is not talking about a saving faith. It's actually talking about the faith to activate the grace you've been given. 
because he goes on and he says that each of us as members of his body have been given according to his grace, different gifts. And if we've been given a gift, let us use them in proportion to our faith. And see, faith and grace when working together don't just save you, but trans- they transform cities. Amen? He talks about the gift of prophecy, the gift of leadership. He said, if you have the gift to lead others, do it with diligence. He talks about the gift of giving. He said, if you had the gift of giving, to give with all liberality, to be freely giving and to not hold back. He talks about the gift of helps. He talks about the gift of serving. He talks about the gift of exhortation, edifying and encouraging, building up others. Ephesians chapter four, verse 29, he said, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. And that word corrupt is not just about cussing or coarse jesting. He said, don't let anything come out of you that would tear down someone else. Amen? See, because there's a lot of things that may not be cussing or coarse jesting, but they're, they're not building up. He said, let every word that comes out of your mouth be for the edification of the body and what? Ministering grace to those who hear you. And see, our words have the power when under the influence of the Holy Spirit to bring heaven to earth in the hearts of those who hear us. When when God's influence, when his Holy Spirit is leading us in how how we're living our life, where we're going, as means are led by the Spirit of God or the sons of God, filling us. Every time Paul talked about being filled with the Spirit, he was always talking about what came out of people's mouths, that we actually can minister grace to those who hear us. And see, I believe that right now, even as we spoke last week in returning to Bethel, and we're going to be sharing even some practical ways that we as a church are are taking steps to return to Bethel. But I want to tell you, the returning to Bethel really is the rebuilding of his body, the restoring of cities, the redeeming of time. Because how many of you know, all of creation is groaning for the sons of God to be made manifest so they would encounter the goodness of their father through those who know him. Amen. And I was, I had an, I had a, just an experience with the Lord. How many of you, the Lord will speak through your life, like in a parable. Okay. And I was actually, in a, you know, and I was actually like standing in the mirror one day and I was talking to the Lord just cause you know, I, you know, I like to work out. How do you, does anybody else like to work out? And I've had a lot of things going on in my life to where I've not been able to work out the way that I want to. And this may sound vain, but stay with me. Hallelujah. To the pure, all things are pure. And I looked in the mirror and I was like, God, I feel like I lost all my growth. I feel like I lost all my gains. I lost all my size. He said, it's time to rebuild my body. And I knew he wasn't just speaking to me for this temple of the Holy Spirit, but he was speaking to us as the house of God, the Bethel, the gate of heaven and the earth. There are some things that God wanted to rebuild in us. Areas where maybe we've seen growth and we've seen strength and we've seen gain, but we don't see a present representation of a past growth or past strength. And even in that, the Lord began to start speaking to me about what training in this season looks like. That it's not just about seeing like how much weight we can move and how strong we can become, but a functional strength, a functional strength to where not only is the body strengthened together in Christ, which the fivefold exists for what? The strengthening of the body, the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, where every one of us is empowered to give away what we've got, not just among the church, but to the world. Because the real ministry doesn't happen here, it happens when you leave here, amen? And Paul actually said that that call was until the whole world came to what? The unity of the faith, the unity of the faith and the perfect, complete stature of Christ. How many know we got some work to do? It's good work, but we've got grace to do it, amen. And as the Lord started speaking to me about this, he was starting to speak about even strengthening for longevity. Strengthening for longevity, that people would not just start strong, but they could finish stronger than they started. And what grace does, because people can get excited, even when, in a, whether it's a move of God or when they first get saved or even coming to a new church. How many, of you, how many of you have ever experienced that initial excitement? But there's days when you don't feel as excited. It's in those times that grace comes and gives you the divine enablement where you get beyond your own ability and you step into his divine ability and can do what you could not do apart from him. And in that he receives the greater glory, amen? 
See, it's not us just simply doing what we can do that brings glory to God. That's an expression of honor. But if we really want to see him receive the full glory that is due his name, we can't accomplish that by our might or by our power, but only by his spirit surrendering our will to his will that his kingdom would come. Amen. Joy and fulfillment and joy is a theme in 2024. Joy, joy, joy. In fact, if you guys could, could you put the, um, our purpose center folks, could you go ahead and put that picture I sent you of that word wealth showing the, the definition of grace up on the screen for us? Because this is very interesting. Joy and grace go hand in hand. And again, that's great. We'll talk about this one, but then the other one, there we go. That's where I wanted to go. Hallelujah, thank you. Grace, grace is the Greek word charis. It's from the same root as kara, meaning joy. Or Cairo to rejoice. Not chiropractic, hallelujah, but some of you get a snap, crackle, pop, and like, oh, praise God. <laughs> Amen. Charis, grace, causes what? Rejoicing. So joy in the life of the believer is actually an outward expression of an inward relationship. As we grow in relationship with the Holy Spirit, we walk in a greater grace and a greater oil of joy, a greater oil of gladness. And in that we find new strength. It is the word for God's grace as extended to sinful man. It signifies what? Unmerited favor, undeserved blessing, a free gift. There's nothing that you can do to earn it. But once we've been given that gift, we have the joy and we have the privilege to give it away. And that is one of the ways that we grow in grace. Let's go ahead, Angel, let's go back to the, uh, the image you had up before that. And let's look at, uh, this is a more in-depth definition. I apologize, it, up at the top it says cares that got cut off by the screen. But it simply means graciousness of manner or act figurative or spiritual, especially the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life, including what? Gratitude. And really there are four heart positions, four, 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 four postures in our heart that are connected to the growing of grace. Number one, our priorities. Our priorities. You'll always stop your grace when you become the focus. You see, joy is found in focusing on Jesus and others before yourself. I love that acronym, joy, Jesus, others, and then you. When we take a, what God has given us for others and we begin to use it on ourselves, or think it's all about us, how do you know God resists what? The proud, but gives grace to the humble, amen? And there is a grace in not thinking too highly of ourselves, but being mindful of what grace has saved us from and what grace has called us to step into. Again, it's the divine influence upon the heart. So grace is a revelation that continues to progress in the life of the believer, but also grace is seen through you as it works in you. That's why there's different measures of grace. Have you ever seen somebody that may be walking in a higher level of grace? In other words, they can get hit and not get hurt. They can go through hell, but nobody knows it. They can be hurting, but, you, but to, to, to the common eye, to the common man, they're like, man, they're, they've got peace, they've got joy. And the truth is, is everybody has the opportunity to go through the same thing. Pain is inevitable, but suffering is a choice. And see, grace comes in moments where you have the potential to quit, to be hurt, to shrink back, and to say, you know what? There's a cause greater than myself. And joy and fulfillment is found in our growing and in our giving. Our growing in God and then giving away what God has given to us. Joy and fulfillment are simply living life filled, full and overflowing, recognizing what God has saved us from, who God has called us to be and what he has called us to do, taking intentional steps each day to grow in the grace he has given to us so we can in turn have something to give or minister to others. Grace is given as a gift but to grow in grace, it requires a choice. 
It requires a choice. Grace is not simply what we enjoy doing, would like to do, or what comes easy. It's what God has gifted and empowered you to do that others are not able to do like you. Oftentimes grace is given not in what is easy, but in what is hard and in areas we don't feel as strong as we want to be. So we can say like Paul, in my weakness, his grace is sufficient. How many of you are thankful for grace? Some translations like the NIV there says his power is sufficient because grace and power go hand in hand and so do grace and glory. So again, growing in grace, the, one of the first heart postures is where are our priorities? Are we truly seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness in every area of our life, trusting that everything else will be added unto us? How many of you ever recognize that when you get your eyes off of seeking God and start seeking on the things you need, that all of a sudden you begin to feel a whole lot less strong and more overwhelmed, right? But when we seek first the kingdom, we overcome in areas where we could otherwise feel overwhelmed. The second heart posture is seasons. Have you heard somebody say, well, you know, my season has changed. But here's the thing is God didn't change. And so first we have to take ownership of what are my priorities? What matters to me most? Recognize when discerning your season that it's not about being in a different season, but you might've had something different show up in your season. Instead of Cain, that what? Sin lied at his door. Paul talked about a door in 1 Corinthians 16, 9. He said, God has set before me a great and effective door, but what? There are many adversaries. And in this year of the door, 2024, I wanna tell you, listen, it's all about walking through the right doors, but also discerning what is at your door. Because Paul, when he saw the adversaries, if he had not been a man of faith, a man of grace, that he could have been intimidated by the giants in his land. He could have been intimidated by the adversarial foes thinking that they were too strong and he was too weak. But thankfully he knew that ministry was hard and he knew that grace was sufficient. Amen? Have you ever had some, some mental warfare, some thoughts that you thought that you knew you weren't called to think? Oftentimes the thoughts that we think that we're not called to that hurt us the most is not the thought we think about somebody else, but it's the thought we think about us. How we see us. There is a, a, a term coined many years ago called new levels, new devils. How many of you have heard of that? I don't believe in new levels, new devils, but I do believe in new land, new giants. Because honestly, if you think about it, Colossians chapter three says, set your mind on what? Things above, things in heaven. If you've been buried with Christ and seated with him, set your mind on things above, not things of this earth that you'd be hidden with Christ and God. Think about it in military terms. Those, you know, you take a, a, a common officer who has just enlisted, what? They're typically gonna be put in the most dangerous parts of the battle, right? Because they see them as expendable. But then you've got these, uh, these, these leaders, these officers, these, these generals, these higher ups, and they're the most protected people on the planet. So when we are growing up in Christ, it's not that we become more susceptible, we actually become more protected when our priorities are in alignment with his purpose, we discern what is at, our, at the door, but we also have an understanding of what honor looks like in that season. Because the third and the fourth heart postures for growing in grace in our heart is honor and gratitude. Honor and gratitude. You'll never have more of what you want until you're thankful for what you have. Thanksgiving always causes what you've got to grow. Thanksgiving is miracle grow. Complaining is, uh, is roundup, hallelujah. You ever try to spray weed killer in your flower bed and you accidentally, the wind got it, or maybe you, you, you sprayed some of the expensive bushes and you were just trying to spray the, you, I just want to get rid of the weeds, but man, it got on this, right? See, the thing about complaining is it never just hits what you're complaining about. It hits everything in your life. And see, praise will cause you to give birth. Complaining will cause you to be barren. 
And so gratitude is huge. But when I talk about honor, it's not honor up. It's not honor for others because you can't honor him and honor others when you don't really honor you. And I feel that there's been an identity crisis in the body of Christ that God is wanting to bring us back to the garden to remind us who we are and what we're called to do and what grace is available to do. Because just like you can't love others if you don't love yourself, you can't really honor them if you don't honor God in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so one of the ways to grow in honor, grow in grace is to honor the grace that you've got. How do you do that? You think about, and don't think long, think about what you were before grace got a hold of you. All right, that's enough, come back. Don't start reliving your past apart from the blood. See, because anytime you look back, make sure you look through the blood. Anytime you look at your past apart from the blood, listen, there's a spirit of a deception that'll try to pull you back. Amen? So having honor for the grace of God, having honor for what God has done in your life up until now, recognizing who you were without him. Even Jesus in John 5 said, I can't do anything by myself, but only what I see the Father do. And then he tells us in verse 20, how he saw what the Father's doing. The Father loves the Son and shows him all things he himself is doing, even greater works than these that we may all marvel. Paul in Ephesians 2 connected the love of God to the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So many times when closing out a letter to a church, whether it be uh, 1st or 2nd Corinthians, Ephesians, the 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, Timothy, Galatians, Philippians, you know, all, all of the, the Pauling epistles, Paul would always close his letter with what? Either the love of God, the grace, the peace, and communion of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the love of God would be interchangeable with the peace, but it was always grace. What he was saying is, I just wrote you something that you're not gonna be able to accomplish apart from him. And what he was saying was apart from communion with the Holy Spirit, being loved by God, walking in the grace of Jesus and having peace that surpasses understanding, you're not gonna get out of your present season. But Paul, the apostle of grace, which was not the apostle of passes, he wasn't the apostle of excuses. He was the one who recognized that apart from God, he was a troublemaker, but with God, he was a peacemaker that in the same way that God had told him some things to do that were hard, that he could find the strength to do those hard things in grace. Grace is not found in doing what you're comfortable with, but in doing what you're called to. God gives us grace to make us more like Jesus. What we do with that grace, how we steward that grace, how we grow in that grace and minister from that grace to others is the key to living life full and walking in the abundance that God is ours for each and every one of us. And Jesus is the example of grace. It said in John 1, 14, and when the word became flesh and dwelt among us, we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. Grace is the enablement to live out truth, to do what sounds hard in a way. I I love this. There's someone quoted that discipline is simply doing what you hate like you love it. Mike Tyson said that, hallelujah. He also said everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. I like that one too. (laughs) But here's the thing about grace. It's not about doing things that you hate like you love it, doing things you think you can't do like you know he's already done it for you. Because when you talk about new land and you talk about new giants, Moses sent Numbers 13, he sent 12 spies to spot the land of promise. 10 came back saying, man, the giants are too great. We are grasshoppers in our sight. We we didn't honor who we were as the people of God. We were grasshoppers in our sight and so we were in theirs. And what you perceive about yourself, if you dishonor, devalue, or don't have a full understanding of the hope of God, the glory of God and the grace of God in your life, it'll be hard to see yourself the way that God sees you. Because when God sees you, he sees a solution to every problem the world is facing. When God sees you, he sees the antidote for every issue. When God sees you, he sees his son, full of grace and full of truth. And what grace does is it causes us to see ourselves the way that God sees us. Joshua and Caleb said they were of a different spirit. They were of a different spirit. They they didn't buy the lie the 10 spies bought. 
They said, if God is pleased with us, he will cause us to enter in. He will give us the ability. And grace is the causing power of God to do what you cannot do apart from grace. I'm so thankful for grace. So thankful for grace. Grace and glory are connected. They go hand in hand. Again, Jesus was the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 1 Peter 4.14 says, If you're approached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. That means when people talk bad about you, and instead of backing up, you're able to be confident in who God has called you to be and to take steps forward. See, the reason why Peter could talk about this, because he knew what it was like at that fire with that slave girl when he was being reproached for the name of Christ, and he recognized what it was like when the spirit of glory lifted, when he denied Christ. And see, not only was there persecution for the first century church, but there are forms of persecution for today's church. And you're not called to be quiet about your faith. We're called to shout from the rooftops when he speaks to us in silence. We're called to rise and shine, to not be silent, amen? But to speak truth in love. Again, we talked about the spirit of grace in Hebrews 10 and that when we take grace for granted, we insult the spirit of grace. Jesus called the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth in John 15, 26. He said, when the helper comes whom I shall send from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will what? Testify of me. He will present witness in your life, evidence of who I am and what I desire for you. He said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into what? All truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All that the father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you or show it to you. And so what grace does, the spirit of grace, the spirit of glory, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, is he brings us into our inheritance as the sons of God. No longer babes desiring just the the milk, but recognizing that by this time, we ought to be teachers. That by this time, our life should be a living epistle read by all men. That wherever we go, people encounter him because he is with us. He is in us. And just like we saw in the book of Acts during our offering, great grace is upon us. Amen. Each of us have been given a unique grace of God that has equipped us as members of his body, so that together we can walk in a greater grace, do greater works, and bring him greater glory. Peter also said in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 and 11, he said, as each one has received a gift, that means every one of you have received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of what? The manifold, all-encompassing grace of God. And the word for gift there is the same word as grace. In fact, the gifts of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, the gift of the Spirit, the word for gift is the same word for grace, charis. And those gifts are to bring joy and encouragement to others, to, to see the ministry of his unmerited favor, his blessing, and, 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 and the goodness of God given away to others as we have freely received and we freely give. Romans chapter 12, verses three through six, again, talks about how gifts are given by grace and talks about how we are to serve God with spiritual gifts. Again, we're talking about equipping for ministry. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who's among you, not to think of himself, what? More highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, Remember the Lord was speaking to me earlier about functional strength training for the body. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts or graces differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Let us put to work 
the gift of God we've been given, the grace of God that we've got, because if we will put to work that grace and work with that grace, that grace will go to work for others. Let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And see, grace sanctifies every gift. A gift apart from grace can become unsanctified. For instance, mercy with cheerfulness. Where are my mercy folks at? Amen? We're all called to an aspect of mercy. In Micah 6, 8, it says, what does God require? But what? To love mercy, do justice, and walk humbly with your God. And so it's not mercy or justice, it's mercy and justice. But sanctified mercy does not just come alongside people and hand them a tissue. I can't believe they did that to you. I know you feel like you're working in a dark place and I, you probably need to go ahead and just give your two-week notice and go ahead and go do something different. <laughs> I've had so many people over the years come and say, you know what, I'm, you know, I, I feel like I'm called to do something else because my workplace is so dark. I'm like, well, why don't you shine? Light it up! <laughs> We're not called to w- run from the darkness. Daniel 12, 3 says those who are wise will shine like the stars. And see, the sky, even, even during the day, is full of stars. You just can't see them because of all of the light, but they show up at night. And we are in a night season in the world, but guess what? To the believer, it's always a new day. The sun of righteousness is always rising in and on us. Amen. And so if you found yourself around people that may not, uh, may not know Jesus the way that you know Jesus, or, wow, they're just so negative, well, turn their tide. If they're talking about problems, why don't you start talking about potential? Why don't you start offering them a different perspective? Why don't you be like Joshua and Caleb of a different spirit? They may be talking about the giants. You can talk about the land. You can talk about the grapes. Say, listen, you're, you're more than a conqueror through him who loved you. And see, when you really hear your father, the father never points out a problem. He always points to the promise. And that's where grace pulls us out of the trap of a problem into the triumph of a promise. In Ephesians 4, 7 and 8, it says that Jesus, to each one of us, grace was given according to what? The measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and did what? Gave gifts to men. And see what grace is, grace is a gift from God to you, but grace makes you a gift for others that God desires to give. Grace is not something you just keep to yourself. But when we receive grace, when we're saved by grace, you say, God, where do we wanna give this gift away? Who, who is it that doesn't have you under their tree? Who is it that, that, that has believed a lie that I can come full of grace and full of truth? Not just to preach at them, but to live my life among them, to show them the way out. That I would not just, see, because grace is not just heard in word, but it's seen in deed. Grace and truth. Again, Ephesians 4, 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, building up the body, that it may impart grace to the hearers. We do not grow in grace and isolation, but in kingdom confrontation. Grace is not some, you may receive an aspect or a measure or a revelation of grace in your prayer closet, but it doesn't belong in your closet. We do not grow in grace apart from people because the people that challenge your grace are the people that need his grace the most. Are you with me? I don't have grace for them. You don't, but he does and he's in you. So if they're too much for you, I bet he's not too much for him. Just say, God, listen, I I must not see something that you're seeing if you've got me working in this place around these people that are getting on my nerves. They're pushing my buttons. They're pulling my strings. Maybe grace wants to set you free from your buttons and your strings. Jesus didn't have buttons. 
Honesty and humility are keys to growing in God's grace. God, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. And if we could look at this in the NIV, angel, verse 6, which by the way, that's angel appoint on pro presenter. I don't actually have an angel on pro presenter, but she's pretty much an angel. Hallelujah. Some of you are visiting like, does he have an angel right there? What's going on there? No, the angels are with you. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. In other words, Paul's saying, listen, I've done some stuff that I could talk about, but I refrain. So no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassingly great revelations. In other words, Paul was bringing new understanding to the church. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. And what Paul was saying is, God, I've got this challenge. And it's, man, it's this messenger of Satan This demonic opposition, this resistance that I'm feeling in my life, it's a challenge. And see, the thing about a challenge is every challenge you ever experience in life is a gift. The bigger the challenge, the greater the gift. Because every challenge that comes to you is an invitation to grow in grace. It reveals what you've not yet become, but it also reveals the potential of what God sees in you. If you'll begin to lean into the grace of God in that situation where you feel like you're weak, you've got nothing to offer, you're empty. And you're saying, you know what? I've done all that I can do and they are no better. That's when God's like, can I have a chance? You think you and I together can make a difference? Because what grace does is it recognizes that it's not what we do for God, it's what God does through us. And see, and again, grace is not about what's doing easy. Grace is not about doing what's easy. Grace is about being willing to do what's hard, but with his energy and not your effort. It's not more bricks with less straw. It's more surrender. It's rest. I know Hebrews 4, it says, since a promise of rest remains, let us fear lest any of you seem to come short of it. The only time I can see permission given to fear in the Bible. 365 times we're told, do not be afraid, do not fear. But this one time, there's a promise of rest. Can you put our state seal up on the screen? One of the first things I saw when I first came to Alabama was this state seal. And I recognized that God had a people. This is before he even got all the eagle words that we're gonna learn what it was like to live from a place of rest. Isn't that that, that amazing? Do you know that's Alabama State Seal? Isn't that amazing? Here we rest. And so where do you need grace? Where you're tired, you're weary, you're heavy laden. Jesus said, come to me, learn of me, be yoked with me, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. It's not that what you're called to is easy, but when we yoke with the Lord and we enter into his strength and we cease from our labors, we actually begin to work the work of grace. And that is faith's works that James spoke about. James said, listen, you tell me you have faith, show me by your works. What he's saying is, show me with your life what you confess with your mouth. And that is what the world is asking the church. The knock against the church for so many years is that we say one thing and did something different. But when our walk lines up with our talk and together they line up with him, they're gonna find what they've been looking for. And he said, not only will you, not only will I give you rest, first Jesus gives rest, but then he says, you're gonna learn rest. And what grace does is grace is an incredible teacher. Grace is an incredible teacher. Because grace doesn't say, I know you don't feel like taking a test, so don't pass it. Grace says, I I know that you didn't study for the test, but I've got great news. It's open book and the author is in the room. (laughs) See, when grace is at work in your life, you recognize that nothing is too hard for you because he's in you. 
And you recognize that anything you ever need to know is, he, is in these pages. And there's a divine influence that'll come into your heart as the Holy Spirit will cause this word to come alive in you and to be seen through the life that you live. So again, Paul goes on to say, listen, I, I've got a lot that I could talk about things I've done, but there's been this thorn in my flesh. Has anybody ever had a thorn in your flesh? What was Jesus' crown made of? Thorns. See, Jesus took upon him a crown of thorns that he could crown us with loving kindness and tender mercies. And oftentimes, see, again, this is a ministry equipping series. And I want to tell you, ministry can be hard. It can be hard, but it's worth it. I talked to a lot of different leaders in a lot of different places lately that again have kind of come to a similar place where they're wanting to go do something different. And I get it, you know, but at the same time, a lot of them, what happened was they got to a place where things got hard. And that's a place where grace wants to come in and make up the difference from where we are to where God is wanting to take us. Because every one of us have a dream in our heart, have a, a, a part of God's plan revealed to us that is bigger than we currently are. But what grace does is it causes you to become bigger. It causes the Christ in you to be greater than everything around you. And to recognize that when you've come to the end of yourself, you've come to the beginning of him. And guess what? When I say ministry is hard, I'm not just talking about pastoring. Okay, believe me, there's no shortage of the potential for thorns in this, pot, in this position, hallelujah. But every one of you is in ministry. Real estate, you're in ministry. Aren't you, Jason? You got some thorns? <laughs> you know, every one of you. Every one of you. Richard Mixon, you got any thorns? Two or three. And that's just Monday before 8 a.m. <laughs> every one of you, wherever you are. Sarah, you got some thorns? What are you going to do with those thorns? In the place where you feel poked, it's an opportunity to press into grace. It's a place to say, you know what? I got hit, but I refuse to be hurt. Because pain is inevitable, but suffering is a choice. And what grace does is it says, I'm not gonna allow what happens to me to happen in me. And it actually sees the increase of God in you so that you can experience the increase of God through you. Does this make sense? Grace is not just grown in the good times. It's often in the hard times, the times when we feel we've got that thorn in our side or that negative narration or those fiery darts, the areas that we feel weak, we feel empty, we feel emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, relationally, financially drained. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Those are the times that, yes, listen, I get it. Jesus took a nap. I know that when Elijah came up against Jezebel, he ate cake and took a nap. But sometimes you don't need a nap and cake. Sometimes you just need grace. 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 Say, God, I want to grow. I want to grow in this area because I really do believe that greater are you and me than anything I'm going to face in this world. And the greater the resistance, the greater the potential for growth, the greater the obstacle, the greater the opposition, the greater the opportunity. And I believe that the church of Jesus Christ worldwide has been up against a lot of resistance. Every one of you, I know that I have in the last few years, the resistance that I have come up against has been greater than anything I've experienced in my Christian life or my before Jesus days. But guess what? I kept knowing that it was gonna work for me. I kept saying, this too shall pass. And I'm not gonna waste a, I'm not gonna waste a trial. I'm not, I'm not gonna say, woe is me. I'm not gonna talk about my pain. I'm gonna press into grace. And every time I've come up against resistance and every time you've come against, up against resistance and every time you found yourself walking through the valley of what felt like the shadow of death, you refused to camp out. You didn't have a barbecue, but you kept walking. 
Every time you found yourself like the three Hebrew boys, just bow your knee to this pressure. Just come on, just repeat after you, just do this, do that. And nope, nope, nope. We're not gonna get out. Of, we're not praying to get out of the conflict. We're praying to come through the conflict because you always come through stronger on the other side and grace is the strength of God when you feel weak. When you feel like that you can't do anymore, that's when you experience the more of God. And see, grace is given. But what are we gonna do with that gift? Go ahead and stand to your feet. Here we rest. Here we rest. I also want to tell you this. Sometimes you can experience the absence of grace when you're in the wrong place. See, because every one of you has a unique gift of God. When I say the wrong place, I don't mean that you need to quit your job. I definitely don't mean you need to quit your marriage. It's amazing how people can take like even a Bible first and twist it, right? See, grace is given to people. It's assigned to places and it's always for a purpose. But sometimes, we're gonna talk more about this in April. Sometimes we feel the absence of grace. We find ourselves fighting a fight that we're not called to. Because anything we do apart from his leading, we're doing in our own strength. When we attempt to stand in a place or operate in a grace that we don't have God-given grace, we can find ourselves frustrated but when we stand in the place we have grace and operate in our anointing and the room our gift has made, we find ourselves feeling full, fulfilled, and overflowing with hope and joy because we're doing what we were born to do. And I've been asking in this new year, I've been asking our staff three questions that I wanna ask you. I want you to go ahead and, and answer these today with the Lord. The first question is, it's about your grace. What has God gifted you to do? What gift has God given you? What grace has God given to you to do like nobody else can do like you? I'll read it to you just like I read it to them. What gift has God given to you to bring glory to him and value to others that nobody else can do like you? How many of you instantly you have an answer? Most of the time, the first answer you get is the right answer. Okay, okay. Because there's things, you, you, you know who you are. Don't try to make it a church answer or a Christian answer. If you're really good at getting broke cars to start working, own that, hallelujah. If you're really good at open heart surgery, don't try to turn that into evangelism. Just keep getting people's hearts working again and we'll get them saved, hallelujah. Right? God has filled this earth and he has so impregnated his church with unmatched gifts and unsurpassing grace, that if we could all recognize who we're called to be, the grace that's been given to us, the gift that we've been given by Jesus and give that gift away to others, he will get glory and the whole world can be saved. The second question is, what role do you believe your current position in life or you, what, what, what part or role do you feel like your current position in life plays in seeing the fullness of his gift and his grace activated and expressed through your life. So in other words, what's your gift and how are you using it where you are? In your current employment, in your relationships, in your neighborhood, in your finances, in each of those eight areas of vision, what, how are you stewarding his gift and his grace? And the last question is, how can we help you to grow in that? Because that's when I talk about rebuild, re returning to Bethel and rebuilding the body, what I, what I really feel like the Lord is breathing on and leading us into a church is to identifying and understanding each of the unique gifts and graces that God has put in this house. And to see those gifts and those graces not operating in just a limited measure, but in their full expression. Because I believe that when we all walk in the fullness of God's grace to us, man, harvest will be the last thing you pray for. Jesus, he didn't even say pray for the harvest. He said, man, the harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. And here's what God is wanting to do. He's wanting to equip the laborers to reach the lost, disciple the ones that God loves, 
and then lead them into greater truth and greater freedom in the Holy Spirit. Some of them are going to come to this church, but a lot of them may not. But the beauty is, is if we're all walking in our gift and his grace and recognizing that we're exactly where God wants us to be, then we can see a whole city saved in a day. We can see a nation turn back to God. How many of you, as we've been speaking today, there's just been just an awareness of some areas in your life that you're called to walk in a greater measure of grace. You have understanding of his gift and you're asking Holy Spirit to show you next steps. I wanna pray for that. Isaiah 30 says that you would not turn to the left or turn to the right, that you wouldn't compare what you've got to what someone else has, but you hear his voice behind you saying, this is the way walk in it. And let me ask you, those of you who have your hands up and those of you who now have your hands up, how many of you have had some thorns in your flesh? How many of you had some thoughts of quitting? Guess what? If you don't quit, you win. If it was easy, anybody could do it. But if it's hard, only Christ in you can accomplish it. And so I pray, I pray for you right now to embrace the fullness of God's grace, to not back away from what's hard. To not find yourself in isolation when you're meant to confront darkness with kingdom light. To be full of grace, to be full of truth, to have an eye that is single in this season. And regardless of what hell is thrown at you, that you're gonna throw all that heaven has back at them. That you're not gonna get hurt when you get hit. That when life doesn't turn out the way that you thought it was and all of a sudden your perfect life is interrupted by a bad day, it doesn't change you. That when someone doesn't speak to you the way that you feel to be spoken to, that instead of saying, do they not know who I am and what I'm, say, you know what? They must just not see who they are. But I'm gonna humble myself and I'm gonna love them. I'm gonna be kind to them. And I recognize I can't change them, but I can be the change. I can be Jesus to them. I can be a living epistle to show them a better and a higher way to live. And God, I thank you that just like in Acts 4, that great power and great grace was upon the disciples as they gave witness to the resurrection. God, I, I just call right now, Holy Spirit, for the spirit of grace the spirit of grace to come upon each and every heart here, Lord, to show us the things that we cannot, things that we've tried to do in our own strength and we feel like that we're not making any progress and to show us what it looks like to bring those areas under your Lordship, under your grace, because we know that your grace, your power is more than sufficient. Lord, let us be a house of grace conduits of grace. Like Peter said, if anyone speaks, let him speak as a, a minister of grace, an oracle of God. God, we just make room today for more of your grace for us that more of your grace could flow through us. And God, we thank you for the joy in grace. God, I thank you that grace makes the things that seem impossible like a great adventure. Like Stephen Curtis Chapman used to sing, this is the great adventure. Come on, saddle up your horses, y'all. Saddle up your horses. What you thought was hard, grace can bring you into rest. Here we rest. Here we rest. We rest from our labors and we enter into his when you rest from your labors, it doesn't mean that you stop doing everything. It means you stop doing the things he's not called you to do. And you start doing the thing that only you can do the way he told you to do it. And so Holy Spirit, I even ask just for clarity. Clarity, 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 clarity for what grace is calling us to do. Clarity for how we're supposed to do it. And most of all, clarity in why we're called. Because it's by grace that we have been saved. The free gift of God. And we want to steward that gift in a way that brings you glory and brings your good to this world in a way that causes all of humanity to repent.
In Jesus' name, amen. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. Come on, let's, let's turn this city upside down today.